Hi guys and welcome back to another Tech Minds video. So it's not very often that we get to see new SDRs being released to the wild, but today I'll show you the Hydra SDR RF1. Now if you're a long time viewer of this channel then you would have noticed that I do not really make comparison videos, especially on software defined radios. But for this product in this video, the Hydra SDR RF1, the video will be purely about its specifications and then live testing without comparing against any other SDR that has similar specs or even looks the same. Now there's a good reason for this and it's not because I'm lazy. Right, let's start off by talking about how the Hydra SDR RF1 came about and who designed it. Now the Hydra SDR is designed and engineered in France and surprisingly it's made in the USA. Now it's nice to see something made in the US rather than Asia. The engineer behind the Hydra SDR also worked on the well-known and well-respected Air Spy R2, so it's fair to say they have plenty of experience in designing cutting-edge software-defined radios. Now the Hydra SDR will set you back around $190 at the time of making this video, and it's available for purchase through DigiKey. What is also surprising and most likely welcomed by the community is that this is all open source. For more information about the firmware, hardware and which open source license this falls under, go and take a look at the GitHub page that of course I will link below. Now the Hydra SDR does have some rather impressive specifications. It covers a frequency range of between 24 MHz right up to 1800 MHz and it features a 10 MHz instantaneous bandwidth, meaning you can listen to 10 MHz of spectrum within the specified frequency range at the same time. The metal case that the Hydra SDR ships with can contain up to three Hydra SDR boards, so you can create your own unique ultra compact phase coherent receiver, like for radar or scanning. Now, one of the interesting specifications that's listed is a 3.5 dB noise floor between 42 MHz and 1002 MHz. Now that's a very low internal noise figure and should result in having great sensitivity on VHF and UHF. The 35 dBm IIP3 RF front end or input third order intercept point means exceptionally high linearity and it should handle strong signals without distortion or overload. Now the specification states it has a 12-bit ADC at 20 million samples per second with a high resolution and dynamic range of 80 dB. Now with custom firmware, apparently it can support up to 80 million samples per second, but at this time I have no knowledge of any custom firmware that can actually do this. I guess we'll have to wait to see what happens there. The Hydro SDR runs a triple core MCU up to 204 MHz. It's also stated to have 0.5 ppm frequency stability with low phase noise. Now this should provide precise tuning with very little drift. And in fact, apparently it's calibrated in the factory using a GPS DO. Now something that we often see with SDRs is a center line or degraded performance around that center frequency. The Hydra SDR apparently has no IQ imbalance and no DC offset. It also has 18 programmable GPIOs up to 100 MHz. Now these can be used to control or respond to external digital logic. Now there's also four programmable synchronized clock outputs. Now this can be used for driving other gear or actually synchronizing multiple SDR boards. What's also really nice to see is that it has a USB type C socket. This means there's more power, better shielding, and it's physically more durable than the older USB standards. So that's most of the specifications. So let's take a closer look at the hardware itself. There are two SMA sockets on this device. One is for the antenna and the other is for a clock in. Now this means you could run an external clock source or GPS DO like a Lear Bodner if you wanted that GPS locked stability. 
Of course, there's that USB-C socket that I mentioned a moment ago. Now, the specification sheet for the Hydra SDR does actually have a detailed image of the main board. You can see the connectors there on each side of the board, which are used to stack them together. That's up to three boards at the same time in the same casing. Now, I do find it interesting that all of this information has actually been shared, literally detailing all of the components on the top and the bottom of the board with little callouts showing what each section is for. Now, you do get a USB-C cable with the Hydra SDR. It's a little short, but it appears to be of good quality. And it also includes what appears to be some ferrite chokes to help with any RF noise pickup on that USB cable. Now, this is especially useful if you're using this in a ham radio shack where you're going to be transmitting as well as receiving. So that's the specs and a look around the hardware. So what about software? After all, this is software defined radio and without a software package, well, it's just kind of useless. Now, currently, as it stands, there's a special fork of SDR++ which works fully with the Hydra SDR. This is available from the Hydra SDR GitHub page. Other software packages are supported like SatDump, GNU Radio, Soapy Hydra SDR, all for use with other applications like GQRX. But at the moment, I wasn't sure how to get this working for Windows. I have been told that Soapy Hydra SDR for Windows will soon be compiled and released on the GitHub page. Now, before I started to look at the software, I performed a firmware update. Now, updating is super simple and the firmware is downloadable from GitHub and it provides all the scripts required for all the different operating systems that it supports. For Windows, it was just a case of ensuring the Hydra SDR was plugged into the computer and then run the included batch file. Now, the firmware upgrade procedure literally took a matter of seconds. So with the firmware updated, I downloaded SDR++ fork for Hydra SDR. If you select source from the top left, you should be able to select Hydra SDR. If it's not there, then you've not downloaded the correct version of SDR++ from the Hydra SDR GitHub page. The first test was with the bandwidth set to maximum, of which is 10 MHz. Tuning around the 2 meter band at 145 MHz, we would see some aliasing on each side of the spectrum as I move that center frequency. Now this is something to be aware of as it could potentially cause some confusion and you may think there is a signal at one of the edges, but it's actually not. I then tested a little higher in the frequency and also tested lower bandwidth. We can select 5 or 2.5 MHz within SDR++. Again, I observed some aliasing on the edges of the viewed band. However, there is actually a statement in the specifications, if you saw it, which I believe addressed this issue. And that says that you do get 10 megahertz of panoramic spectrum, but only nine megahertz is alias stroke image free. So that's something to bear in mind if you do need to monitor a full 10 megahertz bandwidth without aliasing and images. The next test I performed was looking for adjacent channel interference. And to be honest, I actually saw very good results here. Of course, you do need to ensure the gain control is set correctly and not too high, and you're able to listen to channels with strong signals beside them. Talking of strong signals, this is where it is important to ensure the gain control is set correctly. If you try and push the gain control too much, you'll start to see imaging and ghost signals. Now, this is not specific to the Hydra SDR. Nearly all SDRs and even receivers have this issue. Now, it's not really an issue. It's more of a byproduct of incorrect gain control settings. Now, I have a 23 centimeter beacon in range from me. And while it transmits with a horizontal polarization, I should still be able to receive it using my vertical antenna. And yet the Hydra SDR was able to receive this very clearly up at around 1.296 gigahertz. Now I know the Hydra SDR RF1 supports from 24 megahertz upwards, but what if you needed to listen to the HF bands? Well, you can, but you have to use an up converter. 
using the Air Spy Spyverter seemed quite appropriate here. And with the SDR++ configured to use it, even being powered from the Hydra SDR via BIOS-T, I was able to listen to HF ham transmissions and it worked very well indeed. It's unfortunate how it goes, mate. That's the way, uh, as I say, uh, it's just propagation, isn't it, you know? Uh, QSL, sorry, I doubled with you. Yes, sir, thank you for the 59 plus 25. You're about uh, 59 plus 15 plus 20 dB uh, into East Sussex, Roger. Yeah, is that Mike Zero Kilo Yankee Uniform? Yes, I'm Alpha 3 Alpha Lima Le Yankee. Thank you. Well, 5 and the 5 for you, 5 and 5. QRM. And my name is Andy. I am from Moscow. Papa Alpha 3, Papa Bravo Uniform Alpha 3 Alpha Lima Yankee. You're sort of at the low end. Does it, does it sound all right to you on this 4.2K profile before I go tinkering with anything else? Um, so I've got a bit of a reference, or do you think it's a little bit too much of it? And the next test I performed was to disconnect the spyverter and the antenna, and then connect a signal generator to a set frequency of 437 megahertz. Now the output from the signal generator was set to minus 93 dBm, which I believe should read S9 on most modern VHF and UHF radios. Now what I was looking for here was ghost images, of this signal from the signal generator. Now from my brief testing, it appeared to work very well, with no real ghost images or overloading. Of course, setting the gain control correctly is also a must here. The next test I performed involved disconnecting the signal generator and connecting a 50 ohm dummy load, essentially removing any form of antenna. Well, hopefully. I then proceeded to scan the entire supported frequency range of the Hydra SDR. That's from 24 megahertz right up to 1.8 gigahertz. Now what I was looking for here was signal breakthrough from strong local stations, especially around the broadcast band, as I only have one around a mile away from me here. Now there were some very small kind of birdie signals found as I went up the band. They were simply single carriers with no modulation, so it's possible they were generated from within the Hydra SDR. However, I cannot be 100% sure here because I do have a lot of equipment in my shack. Now I did come across a couple of semi-wide transmissions around 400 megahertz, but again, that could have been coming from something local. The real test here that I was looking for was finding something that we could listen to or something that we know is there and strong when an antenna is connected. From the test that I performed, however rudimentary it was, it was clear that the casing on the Hydra SDR was indeed shielding it from most, if not all, of outside transmissions. Now another little test I performed was just to listen to some FM stations broadcasting on the 70 centimeter handband. And well, this worked as expected. Yes, I am sort of quite happy that um, it has sort of three different levels you can um, uh, tune in as uh, you need for, uh, uh, for what you want to use it for and um, uh, yeah it means I sort of um, uh, do things in sort of steps rather than... Uh, Another band that also appeared to receive very well was the Broadcast FM band where we find all of our local radio stations. Now watch as I crank up the gain. All of those ghost images appear which are just duplicates of others around the band. Now this is not a fault of the Hydra SDR it's normal if you overdrive the gain control. But what is nice is that as soon as I back off the gain slowly, all of the signals that we want to see and listen to are clear as day on that waterfall. Even at 10 megahertz, it has great rejection of strong nearby signals. Now using my thermal imaging device, I took a measurement just as I plugged in the Hydra SDR via a USB cable into my computer. And this is the image here on the left which shows a temperature on the casing of around 24C. Now I then spent a couple of hours receiving at maximum bandwidth and then measured the temperature again. Now this is not unexpected and I'm showing you this because I'm sure some of you will be interested, but here we can see the casing has reached around 34 degrees Celsius after a couple of hours use. Now what will be interesting will be performing this same test when there's actually three Hydra SDR PCBs in that same casing. 
as I showed you earlier and talked about earlier, that you can actually stack three of these boards together. Now I don't have any of these just yet, but if I do get them, I will stack them and then run this test again. Well, there we go, guys. That's the Hydra STR RF1. Let me know what you think about it down in the comments below. Now, I may not have covered a specific test that you would have liked to see. However, if you do have something that you really want to see, then please let us know down in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to make a follow up video of this product to show you guys what it can or cannot do. The more tests and suggestions left in the comments will urge me more to create another follow up video. But just remember, I will not make a video comparing it to another product, just like I said at the start of the video. Anyway, guys, there we go. That's the Hydra SDR. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.